Thank you. Uh, so I'm Drina Kami. I'm an undergrad student at the University of Waterloo, and I'll be talking about Unimanual Pen Plus Touch. This is a project I worked on with Fabrice, who was a postdoc at the University of Waterloo, and is currently working at Preferred Networks along with Richard and Brian. And our advisor was Dan Vogel at the University of Waterloo. So the status quo with uh, pen tablet interactions today is something like this. Thank you. <laughs> is something like this. So you have a GUI toolbar or a menu at the top. And while you're writing on the ca canvas, you're constantly switching back and forth between uh, the top of the screen to change your pen and the styles and the canvas where you're actually creating. So we wanted to uh, make this a little less tedious and increase the expressivity of this input space. There's already been a lot of great research in this area, notably Yengli et al, who worked on pen mode switching, and Ken Hinckley et al, who coined the term pen plus touch, and has done a lot of work with bimanual pen input, amongst other things. So our idea works with using the writing hand itself to trigger different modes. So for example, whether the side of your hand is touching the screen, the heel or bottom of your palm is touching the screen, or whether your palm is floating over the screen entirely. So this is a little snippet from our document annotation demo, which uh, I'll go into more detail later. But one thing to note is that there's no toolbar uh, throughout this, so everything's done local to the pen. The research questions we were looking at with this paper were, first of all, can these touches be made with the writing hand without completely destroying the handwriting itself and without being too uncomfortable? Secondly, can these touches be recognized? We're getting some pretty weird input from the tablet here, so can we actually recognize what posture the user is performing? And finally, we wanted to test whether these interactions would make anything better, so are they effective? The first question we answered by first rigorously uh, defining what we mean by a posture. So we came up with a posture design space, and we analyzed a set of postures through a controlled study. For the second question, we trained a deep learning recognizer on the raw capacitive images gathered from that first study. And finally, for effectiveness, we had two demos, a document annotation demo and a vector illustration demo, which we evaluated with a small usability study. So for the posture design space, we defined each posture in terms of six variables, the state of the palm and the state of each of the fingers. So for the palm, we had three possible states. You could either have the side of your hand resting on the screen, the heel of your hand resting on the screen, or floating, where only the pen tip is touching the screen. For the first two fingers, the grip fingers, the thumb and the index, we only had two states, since those, since those fingers are important for maintaining the precision grip. Here, you could either push your index finger down to the screen to touch it, your index or your thumb, or they could be not touching the screen at all. The last three fingers, our non-grip fingers, had three possible states being less important. They could either be touching the screen above or out from the pen tip, or touching the screen below, in from the pen tip, or of course not touching the screen at all. Uh, so a quick note, on this slide you'll see two forms of notations, which we define in the paper, a long form notation and a condensed notation, which we used in the paper but isn't really important to this presentation. So of course, any combination of these is possible. So from the basic palm states, that those can be combined with any combination of grip finger states, any combination of non-grip finger states, and of course, you can go further and create any combination of grip and non-grip finger states, like this gem here, which is side, palm touching, thumb touching, index touching, middle out, ring out, and pinky out. That gives us 324 theoretically possible postures about how your hand can touch the screen. But a lot of these are very uncomfortable. So we cut it down to 33 candidate postures, which we wanted to actually analyze. So cutting this down involved the authors going through those 324 postures uh, and, and trying to come up with rules to eliminate ergonomically, not impossible, but difficult postures. So for the first study, we had two purposes. We wanted to gather quantitative data, so get some numbers about these 33 postures, and we wanted to get some training data to use for our recognizer later. So this study had the 33 candidate postures as well as two control postures, which I'll explain in a little bit. 
In the study, participants were asked to perform representative tasks like tracing lines or tapping on dots across, across the screen. The main purpose of these constrained tasks was to gather qu that quantitative data. So we got lots of measurements about accuracy from this, like accuracy of uh, where they tapped and the deviance of the user stroke from the prompt stroke. We also included two unconstrained tasks, which included writing the word important on a line, as well as drawing a small smiley face in a box. The purpose of this wasn't for quantitative data, but to give the users a more realistic environment of how they would use these postures and to hopefully influence their rating. Finally, the user was asked to rank each uh, posture between one and seven. So this is where our control postures come in. At the start of the experiment, the participants were asked to complete the task set, first with their normal handwriting posture, which we then asked them to rate this as seven. So that's some, a way we could calibrate the seven between the different participants. And then we also had a specially chosen difficult posture from that 324 possible posture set, uh, which we asked participants to rank one, the idea being that this would calibrate the lower end of the scale between participants. So we got a lot of data. I won't go into a lot of detail here, but at the top we have our two control postures, then the side palm-based postures, heel palm-based, and floating palm-based postures. And the metrics we gathered are the preference ratings. Oh, note, by the way, that here everything uh, on the left is better. So if a posture has a lot of points on the left axis, that means it's a better posture. So yes, we had preference rating here. We had two error metrics, the start error, so the, how far away the first point the user touched was from the, where they were actually supposed to start, and the trace error, which was the average deviation of the user's stroke from the prompt stroke, and drawing speed, how quickly they were dropping pixels down, which we used as a proxy for comfort. So from this, and using uh, thoughts about what would be recognizable and what we wanted our final demos to look like, we chose a set of 10 postures which we wanted to pursue. So these 10 are used throughout our demos and are also used for our recognizer. But one thing to note, which we discovered from this first study, was that even excluding those 10, the majority of these postures fall within a similar range. None of these are exceptionally terrible. Uh, most of these seem to be okay for most participants. So we think this answers the first question of whether these intentional touches can be made by the user comfortably while still maintaining accuracy with a yes. Then we had our deep learning recognizer. So this was used for that second question. Uh, this was done by Fabrice and his colleagues at Preferred Networks. And here we trained a convolutional neural network on the raw capacitive data from the tablet. So you can see a sample of that data in the inset over there. And this is basically just what's touching the tablet at a given moment. We had about 11,000 images for each posture, which we also augmented with uh, rotation and translation. And then we had, on our 10 posture set, we had an average accuracy of 91%. So although there could be improvements to this uh, recognizer, we think this answers the question of whether these are at all recognizable, again with a yes. Then to test for the effectiveness of this technique, we had our two demos. So we designed a demo for two common pen tablet applications, the first being a document annotator and the second being a vector illustrator. I'll be going through the, each of these and how we associated postures with given actions. For the document annotator demo, we assigned side palm, so the most basic, the simplest, usually for most participants, the most similar to their writing posture, to the pen tool, because this is what you'll probably be using the most when you're uh, annotating a document. Then we associated heel palm with the highlighter for a few reasons, the first being that switching between side palm and heel palm is a very quick interaction. And also that heel palm has a sort of real world, world metaphor that it's how you also hold a highlighter when you're highlighting something in the real world to get that tip to align with the paper. We associated floating palm with scrolling the document. This makes sense because it's a coarser action. So for scrolling, it's better because it's a big action which you don't need to worry about being terribly precise. 
and then we associated side palm with your pinky out touching the screen for eraser. This is very easy to switch to from side palm, and it gives you lots of motility despite the added friction of having your pinky touching the screen. For something with more friction, like side palm with ring and pinky out, we use this for styling. So because you've got so much of your hand touching the screen, this offers a little less large scale motility, but it's great for something like a pop-up menu or a marking menu where you only have to move your pen tip. And so here you can see the stroke is now red. For uh, the other gesture we had was floating with your index touching, which we used for performing gestures. So here it's in action in the process of performing an undo gesture. Uh, we chose this one because the index finger does obfuscate your view, so it's harder to see what you're drawing. But for gestures, you don't really need to see what you're drawing. For example, just drawing small arcs or small arrows going up and down. So it made sense for something like this. And then the last posture we had associated with this one was for searching. This was floating palm with your pinky below the pen tip. We ha the reason we chose this one was for a sort of metaphor, again, where the pinky is reminiscent of a sort of baseline upon which you can write the word which you're searching for. Okay, so those are the seven postures we used for this application, and now I'm going to break it down into sort of how we designed and how we chose to design this space. So we have the three most simple postures, side palm, heel palm, and floating palm, associated with the three most common actions, pen, highlighter, and floating. Then we have less common actions like erasing, styling, gestures, and um, searching associated with the other postures. So one obvious way to group these is, like I just said, simpler postures with the more common actions. But another way which we tried to group these when we were designing it was to have a sort of semantic relationship. So all the side palm-based postures, because that's how most people usually hold their writing hand, are associated with creating. So in this case, the pen tool, erasing, or changing the color. The heel palm, being very quick to switch to, is associated with a tool you want to switch to, so the highlighter. It's, a, it's like a shortcut posture. And then floating palm being coarser is associated with larger actions, like interacting with the document as a whole. Our next demo was a vector illustrator. And here it's the same idea, except now side palm, instead of being the regular pen, it's the Bezier tool. Heel palm lets you modify the shapes you've drawn. Floating palm lets you move the shapes around. Side palm with your pinky out lets you change the side palm tool. So this is different from our a document an annotator because a document annotator is simpler. But a vector illustrator has a lot of tools which you might want to use. So we included this sort of meta tool which lets you switch between other tools. And then again we had side palm with ring and pinky out for styling. and side palm with pinky in for inserting text. Again, we're using that pinky in as a metaphor for a baseline, but because now we're in that side palm posture, it's inserting the text as opposed to searching the document. And finally, again, we have uh, styling, this time also with floating palm, because this is the same action, but approached from the context of manipulating the document. And we have gestures again with floating and index touching. Here we're showing off copy and paste. All right. So the next, so breaking these down again, we have the three most common postures, side palm, heel palm, and floating palm for the most common actions in this application. And then we have the other actions for less frequently occurring uh, operations. And again, we try to have the same grouping. So creating is with a side palm, and now you also have the added option of changing the tool you're creating with through the side palm. Heel palm is our quick switch posture, and floating palm is our overall document manipulation. So then uh, another thing to note with these is that we also have ring and pinky are associated despite their palm states. So when you do ring and pinky in the side palm state, you change the color of what you're creating, 
but when you do ring and pinky in the floating palm state, you change the color of what you've selected. So it's the same, it's similar, but it, from a different context. So we evaluated these with, two us with a usability study where participants were asked to look at, were asked to perform various actions with these postures. So in the document annotator, that included uh, circling and highlighting words, whereas in the vector illustrator, this was recreating those houses. Um, participants were asked to also complete a training session where they, were, uh, where they had 10 minutes to train on the posture set and also were trained for each specific application. Uh, from the results of this, we found that a lot of participants enjoyed the idea and were interested in having one or two postures for actions which they used a lot. So, for example, switching between a uh, pen and eraser on an iPad or something like that. We also noticed that uh, in both of our applications, by coincidence, the cursor would change when you switch the tool. Participants found this very useful. When they couldn't quite remember the posture, they would sort of fiddle with it until they got the cursor to be what they wanted to. So this was sort of a, a great way to provide feedback to the user with this technique. Um, so we hope with this technique that we can make the pen input space more expressive and contribute to the other work in this field. But before I conclude my talk, I'd also like to give a quick shout out from our friends at Preferred Networks who are hiring for HCI research. And also a quick shout out to Dan and Fabrice for helping me, uh, mentoring me into my first research project over the last year or so. Thank you very much. So we have time for some questions. Yes? Oh, hi. Uh, great talk. I am here representing all the left handed people. Um, <laughs> we not only use a different hand, but also different postures and different start and ending points when we are drawing. Do you think your input technique is suitable for us as well? <laughs> well, so during the first study, we did have three left-handed participants, which we didn't include in the results, just sort of as a case to, to explore it. And yes, the postures were relatively different. But while I was doing the demo yesterday, um, in the past week, I took the same recognizer and just flipped it. Um, and I found that a few left-handed participants, that, would, that was enough. But for others, it wasn't. So I think it, the true answer is it would require more research to get it to work successfully for both right and left-handed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, uh, Natya, Academy of Fine Arts in Saarbrücken. So as someone who is drawing for eight hours a day, I have to say that your hand is getting very stiff after working, so either you have to stop every few hours and stretch your hands, or you, are, you can't use your hand after those eight hours. So I wanted to ask that, uh, do you think that your system could help to actually work longer? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I guess I, I see where you're coming from, in that since you're not writing with the same posture for extended periods of time, it, it would make it more comfortable. I would say it would probably require more research. What we noticed in our study was that participants, like uh, we had short breaks where participants were allowed to shake out their hands while they were uh, doing these postures. And we also noticed that the postures, uh, for the authors, the postures were more comfortable the day after. Like uh, if you were using them for multiple days, they'd become more and more comfortable. So maybe is my answer. <laughs> Um, Paula Senti, Adobe Research, uh, really nice work. I was wondering, how does this interact with some of the spurious touch rejection systems that are built into things like the iPad? Oh, with the iPad. So um, I'm not sure exactly what the iPad is doing. Here we had the Wacom tablet, which gave us the raw capacitive data. We did have some issues where, for example, if the tablet thought there was only a palm on the screen, it would stop giving me information, which wasn't useful. Um, so for that, we had this little workaround where as long as there was a finger touching the screen somewhere, the tablet would consistently give us that information. Um, but yeah, on the iPad, this information isn't available right now. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think that's it. I'd like to thank all the speakers again. And...
I've been asked to make one last announcement. We're ending just slightly early because you guys were all very efficient, so thank you. Um, apparently, 